welcome to Marshmallow Reads. Today I'm going to tell you about the books I read in November. First up was The Grace Year by Kim Leggett. In Garner County, where this book takes place, the girls are told that they have magical powers capable of great evil, including luring men away from their wives and driving other women insane with jealousy. Okay. Uh, so in order to stamp out their magic, the girls are forced to fend for themselves out in the wilderness for their grace year. And not everyone makes it back. Yeah, this book is not subtle. Uh, I don't know if it thought it was being subtle, but it certainly wasn't. It's another one of those dystopian YA novels spun off of like The Hunger Games and Handmaid's Tale. Like... You know what it's trying to do and trying to be about, but I don't necessarily think it actually gets there. So this is talking about like the role of women in society and how they're seen as less than and only their only purpose in life is to be caregivers and to raise children, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but like a lot of books like this, it doesn't necessarily consider all of the people that live in our society like the gay and trans community. Yeah, so like the gay question is asked, like what if a woman was gay and didn't want to be with a man? Like it, it was asked and it was kind of answered, but there was not a peep about trans people, like usual. Ultimately what the book ends up doing with the one gay character was like, yo, it's totally fine to be gay but only in secret. Don't you dare tell a single soul. Don't you dare show any sort of affection in public. Like, is this supposed to be a happy ending for her? I don't know. I was also getting weird feelings about the relationship between the main character Tierney and Riker, this hunter that she meets during her grace year. Tierney is supposed to be 16 at the start of this year and turning 17 at the very end when they actually like are together. But Riker says that he's been hunting Gracier girls for years now. How, so, so what age is he when they're together? Like, it's, it's definitely seems to be more than a couple years older than 17. And that is absolutely creepy and disgusting. It just really, really creeped me out that this book was making this relationship seem okay and like a good thing. Like, I know, like, clearly the society in this book is absolutely ass backwards, but why? Why is it portraying this relationship as anything but criminal and disgusting and, and gross? I don't get it. And beyond that, like, this book is asking us to imagine a world where we, women, are all working together to make the world a better place instead of tearing each other down. Like, that's a nice idea, but it, that's all That's all it says. It only states this idea. It doesn't necessarily go into details about how women can be doing this, how women can be, women and other people, like everyone should be working together to make this world a better place for everyone in it, including the gay and trans people. Like, I just, it really, really rubbed me the wrong way. And the only thing I liked about this book was that there was a little bit of nuance in Tyranny's character, she ends up having feelings for Riker. They have a sort of thing out in the wilderness, but she also has feelings for this guy waiting for her back in town. And when she gets back to him, she is understanding enough of her own thoughts and feelings that she feels like she has a big enough heart to be able to love two people, each in their own way. And this sounds more mature than anything I've read in other YA novels, and I do like that part. But literally everything else about this book just felt wrong and weird. I gave it a 2 out of 5 stars. I don't think it's worth your time. Thankfully, I had a very nice palette cleanser after this one with Lots Away by Darcy Little Badger. This has such a cool fantasy world setting. It's filled with vampires fairy ring transit systems. So like replace airports with fairy rings. It's very cool. And there's also ghosts and all sorts of other stuff. The story starts with Ellie, a lot away, and out of nowhere, her older cousin is found dead. And the police think it was an accident, but Ellie knows better. 
she was visited by Trevor the night of his death, um, like his soul, spirit, something visited her right as he died and warned her to keep his wife and son safe from this rich guy. And because Ellie knows that many crimes in general remain unsolved, and especially crimes involving violence against natives, <coughs> a cab. <coughs> Because of that, Ellie is determined to solve her cousin's murder. And just immediately, there was such a huge difference in the characters. Like, these characters feel so much more well-rounded and real than anyone in the Grace here. Like, yes, these, these still might be a little bit cartoony, especially since it is like more of a YA, but they still feel like real people. Anyway, I really, really liked Ellie's superpower. So in her family, across generations, they have this power to raise the dead, but only animals. Don't ever try to raise humans. They are not the same. Uh, the, if you ever try to raise a human, they come back as like a angry, sad husk of themselves. The main ghost that Ellie brings back is the ghost of her dog, Kirby, and he is just so adorable and cute and loving and just a very good boy. Ellie is also learning to bring back ghosts of other animals, but because of the dangers that can come with this, she starts small. So like insects, trilobites, that kind of stuff, and is trying to build her way up to the bigger things. Like her grandmother is able to bring back a woolly mammoth and like, instead of a car, rides him to the grocery store. <laughs> just, I love, I love details like that in this book. And the overall mystery was also really great. Like it left you enough breadcrumbs along the way to allow you to make educated guesses about where the mystery was going. And it did this without having to like spoon feed you every little discovery. And we've got ace representation. Ellie is asexual and she's pretty chill about it. Like she doesn't doubt herself at all and can even crack jokes about it. And I love to see it, especially in teen and YA media. I really, really hope this becomes a series because I absolutely adored this book. I gave it a five out of five stars. I really encourage you to read it if this sounds anything like something you would like. I, I love it. The next book I read in November was The Hawthorne Legacy by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This is the sequel to The Inheritance Games. Yes, I know that this is an obvious self-insert, secret heiress, escapist fantasy, but I like it that way. <laughs> I, it's what I really, really enjoyed about the first book. I loved all the puzzles and secret passageways of the big mansion. This one I liked less so. There was just something about the plot that didn't really draw me in like the first one did. They're continuing with the mystery of like why Avery, this random girl, was chosen to be the heir of these billions and billions of dollars. I'm still definitely going to be reading the third book in this series, but I don't know, I'm, I'm a little nervous. So about the love triangle, I'm predicting that Avery and Grayson are endgame, and this book is their new moon. So they're doing their best to stay apart because of reasons, supposedly for Avery's own safety, but I don't know about that. This allows Avery to flirt with Jameson, Grayson's other brother, while still being able to end up with Grayson in the third novel. I don't know. I don't actually, I don't know if I want, because uh, I think I prefer Jameson overall. He's more goofy, just a, a more, personable type of character. Grayson is very like dark and and brooding and uh, nah, 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 nah. like, I don't know, he seems kind of boring. I want Avery to end up with Jameson, but I have a feeling that she's gonna end up with Grayson. I was really happy to see the character of Max in this story. Like she was briefly introduced in the first one, but didn't really get a lot of screen time, page time, whatever. Avery really needed to have a good girlfriend on her side, especially for this one, because she kept ping-ponging back and forth between Jameson and Grayson, like it was giving me whiplash. And while this was all really fun to read, how they kept, you know, flying to different uh, vacation homes that she now owned because of this inheritance, like it just, it got to the point where this stupid amount of wealth really started to get on my nerves. Like 
Ugh, of course, like the youngest brother, Xander, invested in crypto and is now a millionaire out of nowhere. Like, it's getting harder and harder to ignore the fact that billionaires like Tobias Hawthorne are just straight up evil people. Like, I don't care what you invented or what company you led, no one, no one should have that much money. Like, especially knowing that most of it is stolen wages from the people that are actually producing the goods and services. Like, pay your damn people a living wage and pay your damn taxes. <laughs> like, I know this isn't what I was supposed to be thinking about when I was reading this book, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> and another thing that I found very amusing was... There were so many secret relatives in this book. Like, I don't think I have read or seen a piece of media with this many god dang secret relatives. It was very funny. <laughs> but anyway, besides all that ranting, I did have fun, I guess, reading this one. Like, it was fine. It wasn't as much fun as the first one. I gave it a three out of five stars. I hope the third one has a nice finishing touch to this series. And the last book I read in November was Reprieve by James Han Matson. This is a horror story based around the brutal murder that occurred in a full contact haunted house escape room sort of place. Ugh, it was so gross. Of course, the owner of this haunted house is a traditionalist. He believes that men should be the breadwinners and women should be child rearers. And that's it. Uh, that's, that's uh, you know, a nice idea. And maybe some people want that to be the case, but nowadays it's, uh, it's pretty hard for a family like that to exist with a single breadwinner. It's just, it's just not how it works anymore. Now on top of that, we have an example of someone going down the alt-right pipeline. This average guy, Leonard, who works at a hotel that partners with this haunted house, he starts having weekly drinks with the sexist John guy and ends up becoming his puppet and losing his girlfriend in the process because of his extremist views. And I don't know if this was the author's intention. I have a feeling it was, but I'm reading into it that there's no one that is all good or all bad, except maybe John, he's pretty awful. But just in general, like, especially, you know, towards the readers, just because you are in a marginalized group, so like black, gay, etc. It does not automatically make you a good and perfect person. We all need to be analyzing our biases and striving to always be better than we were before. Like, I think it's really important to not demonize the acknowledgement that everyone kind of has these like problematic thoughts. And just because it's the first thing you thought or something you thought at all does not mean that that is how you as a person feel. Part of being a good person, in my opinion, is confronting these thoughts and understanding that this isn't necessarily who you are just because you had these thoughts and working to, I don't know, reduce, like, I, I, I don't know how to put this, like, continuing to work on yourself to be a more accepting and understanding person is what I think makes a good person good. It's not like an inherent trait based on you know, whatever category you're put in. I'm rambling. Basically, no one is perfect. As long as you keep trying to be a better person and be better to all humans around the world is gonna make you a good person in my book. And then towards the end of the book, it really starts to drive home what I think is the main point of this book. Like, how is it possible to watch a video of real life police brutality and not hate it? How can you say it is not a systemic issue when the majority of police brutality victims are black or when the justice system repeatedly protects these killer cops? It's pretty clear that the laws of this country were written to serve specifically wealthy, white, cis men. It is not a flaw. It is in fact a feature. <sighs> and uh, we, as as just people of this country, of this earth, have to reckon with that fact and do what we can to improve our situation and the situation for everyone else. <sighs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this one got me thinking quite a bit. <laughs> um, it was a 
very compelling story with an important message. I think you should check this one out. I gave it a four out of five stars. Okay, I only read four books, but I feel like I talked forever. So I'm gonna make this ending short and sweet. If you liked this video, go ahead and give it a like. If you really liked this video, consider subscribing to my channel. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Do something nice for yourself, do something nice for others, and I will see you in the next one.